Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, Walda, thanks for uh, moderating the session. Um, so Algo Therapeutics is a, a, a small biotech that started in 2018. We're focused on uh, solving complex pain issues, and our uh, dedication over the last few years has been to peripheral neuropathic pain uh, with a program called ATX01, which you'll know everything about within a few minutes. And uh, we have two areas of focus, as you'll see. One of them is the highly prevalent uh, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. And one is, uh, quite by contrast to the first one, uh, the orphan disease erythromelalgia. Um, just very quickly, a word on the team. We're, uh, I'd love to say we were a young and energetic team. We're rather energetic, but not young anymore. So there's quite a bit of experience in the team, which is nice. That's helped us actually push this along quite quickly, as you will see. Uh, a lot of the team, most of the uh, of the, the the people on the right hand side here, are focused on clinical development, which is where we're at now. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our, our board of directors. Um, we're supported by four investment funds out of Europe, um, and we have a very solid board of directors, in particular with our independent members here. Uh, Scott Bird and Ed Harrigan. Ed Harrigan, incidentally, I cannot not say this, is a scientific advisor to Karuna, so since Karuna is at all mines these days, it's, you know, it's fancy to say that. But even more importantly, I guess, our, our scientific ad board is, is truly second to none. Every time we bring them together, we kind of wonder, you know, what took them here in the first place, because we're a small company with an interesting object objective, but um, these guys are absolutely stunning. Uh, Céline Greco is actually the inventor of ATX01. Um, Roy Freeman is a professor of neurology at Harvard. He's got his name in, you know, dozens of publications on neuropathic pain. Guido and David, oops, uh, Guido and David here. Did I, am I, I'm probably blocking this. Uh, probably amongst the most prominent clinicians in the U.S. and in Europe about uh, neuropathic pain. Uh, Kurt. Uh, Ross Bra has been was at the FDA for many years and in charge of pain and other areas. So we've been blessed with a number of you know very um, good willing and and smart fairies around the crib really. So ATX01 is as you will see is a program that has a number of potential applications in so far as it is targeted to uh, relieve peripheral neuropathic pain. And so the indications that we are focusing on are clearly the top two, CIPN and erythromelalgia, as I just mentioned. But there is a long list of other potential indications that we plan to develop clinically um, as soon as we're done with the first two. Um, so let's focus on CIPN for a minute, and that'll help me introduce the program to you. The, the issue with um, peripheral neuropathy caused by chemotherapy to quite an extent, is the fact that it's underestimated. Uh, there is actually 60 to 68 percent of chemotherapy patients that will suffer from uh, neuropathy. And after six months, 30 percent still have their neuropathy and will keep it as a chronic condition, uh, probably for years if they, if they survive that long. It causes, among other things, debilitating pain in the hands and feet. And as a result, um, it's one of the leading causes of treatment interruption, um, particularly among uh, breast cancer, um, where taxanes and platinum salts are broadly used, and, and they're clearly among the biggest culprits in terms of, uh, of the side effects. Uh, there is no approved treatment uh, for this condition. There is a lot of off-label uh, use of antiepileptics, of antidepressants, and then they do have some efficacy at the cost of additional side effects. So, you know, one of the issues has been that these treatments are, are used systemically, which first of all creates a negative reaction from the oncologist that doesn't really want you to introduce anything else into that patient's body that could interfere with their oncolog oncological treatments. Uh, and secondly, fails to actually deliver the, the active to where it needs to be which really is in the skin of the feet and hands of the patient. This is where the nerve fibers are that create, generate, and transduct the pain message. So what we've done is actually the reverse. We've designed a product that will go directly 
to the site of these painful nerve fibers, in other words, the skin of the hands and the feet, done that in the form of a gel um, that contains amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is a well-known uh, antidepressant, been around for a number of years, and it is known to have some activity on neuropathic pain. The issue with this form of neuropathic pain is you just cannot achieve sufficient concentration at the desired site without essentially killing the patient if you take it systemically. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really been the trick with this program. Uh, more broadly speaking about ATX01, uh, we have a very vast patent estate that uh, protects ATX01 out to essentially 2040. Um, and obviously our regulatory strategy is going to play a role also in how uh, well protected the asset is once it's in the market. So a little bit of information about why we believe in this product and, and, and why its mode of action is uh, rather convincing. Uh, what we've done initially just to test the hypothesis is to do some very simple patch clamp experiments. And what we've shown here is that with increasing concentrations of amitriptyline, we, uh, we managed to create inhibition of the activity of the sodium channels uh, in a dose-dependent manner, uh, which incidentally enabled us to calculate the IC50s for amitriptyline on, the, uh, on those channels. And the interesting thing is not only do we have this inhibitory activity on the three channels that are uh, closely linked to pain, so that's one seven sodium channels, one seven, uh, one eight, and one nine. But we see that the non-pain related channels, uh, which would be one one and, and one six, actually have IC fifties that are about ten times higher than those for the nociceptive sodium channels. So there there seems to be an affinity or a preference in terms of inhibition of the nociceptive sodium channels. And clearly, we find the same results when in a different type of experiment, which is a skin nerve model, um, we see that the C and A delta fibers, so uh, pain, heat, uh, where you'll find the burning pain type of messages, are inhibited preferentially over the A beta fibers. So again, we see this clear inhibition by amitriptyline and a distinction between the, the biological elements that contribute to pain and those that don't. Um, the, uh, the, the other element of development that we've done then prior to getting into the clinic was, uh, making sure that the toxicity was acceptable. There is, I mean, that is one of the strengths of this approach is that we see virtually no toxicity up to date. And we then ran a phase one program where we not only looked at safety, uh, both systemic and local. Uh, we also looked at pharmacokinetics because with this product being amitriptyline, one of the early questions of FDA and in fact EMA as well was, so we know amitriptyline, we know its tox profile. So if you can show us that you have low concentrations compared to oral amitriptyline, we're not going to give you a hard time with these things. So that's why we included pharmacokinetics in the phase one design and we showed that um, the topical application of high concentration amitriptyline gel actually creates lower systemic concentrations than the lowest possible oral dose of amitriptyline. So that was very reassuring. And since then, when we went through INDs, we haven't had any questions about this from FDA anymore. Now, the next logical step in this presentation would be to show you animal data. So I'll do that, but I'll show you animal data in men. Yeah, that's, it's, it's slightly more uh, exciting. And I'm saying this because this is clinical data, but it's not part of our pivotal clinical regulatory program, if you will. Um, these are investigations that were published by clinicians in hospitals that have been compounding high concentration amitriptyline and applying it topically for the best of seven years now. And some of them published their data in 2019 in supportive care in cancer. They, they followed, for, well, they prospectively followed 44 patients in their institutions with CIPN with reasonably severe levels of pain. You can see that the median um, level on the pain rating scale was seven at entry. And after one month, 
they had reduced the median pain by four points. Now, a four-point pain reduction is not something you see very often in a trial. So this has something to do with methodology. Okay, this is an open label. Uh, it's not double, double blind. It's not placebo controlled. So you'd expect to find more than there actually is. But you never see placebo effects in this type of pain higher than two. So there's something in there. There's something between that two and that four that probably is efficacy. Even more convincingly, of the 44 patients, 16 had stopped or reduced their chemotherapy because of the pain. And all 16 were able to go back to their original regimen. So that's now binary. It's not about how many points. It's about, do I can I tolerate this treatment now? Um, I'll go quickly over the second one, which happened two years later. It essentially shows the same type of thing, a six-point reduction over one month. Uh, what we like about this study is the fact that there were some non-responders, uh, which is always reassuring in terms of you know how solid the, uh, the approach was. But anyway, um, enough of this. This is really, it's preliminary data. It's not our clinical plan, but it's, you know, it's nice to have that before you go into clinicals, really. Um, so we now are in phase two, and this is one of the two studies that we're currently con conducting. So the ACT study is a phase two, three study in CIPN. It's happening in centers in the US and in Europe, uh, over 40 centers in total. Uh, 240 patients into three groups, two concentrations of amitriptyline applied topically, and a placebo arm, 80 patients in each group. Our primary endpoint is the reduction of pain on the numerical pain rating scale. Sounds a little basic, right? But that's what FDA wants. That's what EMA wants. So there's a host of additional secondary endpoints, which are the ones you would expect. They have to do with quality of life. They have to do with other scales that are specific to neuropathic pain. But at the end of the day, what will really matter is the numerical pain rating scale. So this study is, is well advanced. We have 66% of the, uh, the patients in the study. And we expect to have the final results by the end of 24. So our early data is going to be probably in the fall. Uh, and then we'll move into phase three, and the product should possibly get into the market by 28. Our second phase two program, as I mentioned early on, is a completely different indication, which is erythromyalgia. Uh, orphan disease characterized by attacks of pain and reddening of the hands and feet. So a patient will typically get one or more attacks in a day or in a week, when they, their hands and feet become red, warm, and, and, and with that burning, burning pain uh, in their limbs. Um, it's an orphan disease. It's one to two patients per 100,000, and it's obviously both a vascular and a neuro neurological condition. The study we're conducting, oh, the colors aren't really coming out, uh, is, a, um, is a crossover study. So we've now finished recruiting all of the patients, it's only 14 patients, but this being an orphan indication. Um, and it's a crossover design, which will give us interesting power. It's, hap it's happening at both the Mayo Clinic here in the US and at the Erlangen University Hospital in, in uh, Germany. So this one will read out six to nine months earlier than the CIPN study. In other words, within a couple of months, we will have the top line results of this exciting study. And then we intend to apply for breakthrough. This is happening under ODD and fast track. Um, apply for phase two for a confirmatory study. Unless, of course, the results are so great that we don't need a confirmatory study. That's not our plan. Um, and as you can understand, the rationale there for this indication, you know, coming next to CIPN is that it gives us early clinical data. If we keep going at the space, it will be in the market one to one and a half years earlier than CIPN. Time to market is obviously essential with great market protection because of the, the uh, orphan status. Um, and as a standalone indication, it actually has a potential of not very far from $1 billion a year between the, the US and Europe. So this is really our development plan. You've seen these two clinical trials. We're obviously doing all of the good stuff that needs to happen in parallel. Um, that again, this is a, a team with a lot of experience in this, in this uh, 
in this field. So the, the, the rest is also taken care of. The potential, the sales potential in CIPN, um, about $1.4 billion between the US and Europe, um, peak year sales. The potential in EM, as I said, close to $1 billion between uh, the US and Europe, obviously very, with very different price assumptions between the two indications. Um, and, you know, the company is has raised 35 million so far. We're currently living on the 20 million uh, Series B that we raised last March. Uh, that takes us to about one year after the uh, readout of our phase two studies. So we'll be in a good position to either uh, raise a Series C and finish our development or enter into partnership with farmer companies that could be interested in this kind of program. And um, hopefully the patients will actually start to benefit from uh, the uh, ATX01 program in 2027 in erythromelalgia. Um, yeah, that'll, I'll skip this uh, summary and just, you know, just one word about this. I saw this slide this morning. I know, uh, uh, Waldo, you were taking shots of these slides this morning. 3% of CNS is actually pain. Well, you know, this is why there's so few deals on this, this chart with analogs. Uh, you have to go back to 2015 to have not even 10 significant deals in the space. So the buy, this is not so much about value, it's about scarcity and the need for products in the space. And that, you know, that really is what keeps us going is, is the, the sense that, you know, erythromelalgia, CIPN, you know, let's get this program out there and, and, and uh, get patients relieved. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.